So just in time for summer, I received a package from the group at Viking Books and Penguin Random House. They sent me the next book in their series, Penguin European Writers. So when I received the package, I was extremely happy to see what was inside and to begin reading a new book. And that book is this one, The Beautiful Summer by Cesare Pavisi. After the success of reading Merce Brodoretta's Death in Spring, I was more than excited to get to this book. And so upon arrival, I picked it up and read it almost a day after and consumed it all in one sitting. It's only a short 100 page novella, Yet the power of this story is great. In comparison to Death in Spring, it does not hold up. Yet in its own right, it is an equally worthy book and one that I did enjoy reading. However, I must say that I am definitely tied as to whether it is a four star or a three star book. And throughout this review, I'll be discussing why I'm on the fence about this book and whether it is truly a four star read or just a three star read. <laughs> Akin to Death of Spring, the design of this cover definitely suits the series, yet made me wonder whether the book inside would match. We have the plain panel and the pattern which depicts each different book, and a black and white picture to match. This one, however, definitely encapsulated more of the theme and the topic of the book inside, whereas Death in Spring didn't have that same connection. And yet both books capture that fractured sense of teenagehood, caught between childhood and adulthood, trying to find your place in the, in the world and trying to understand your own identity within it. It was very interesting to see how, the, how both these books had similar themes, yet at the same time, were so different in their delivery and so different in their writing. This book in particular follows a young woman, 16 years old, as she learns about her own sexuality based on the backdrop of Italy, with a strong cultural misogyny and also a permeating religious life which dictates the way that these people should be behaving. I was extremely excited to read this story. The blurb sounded exactly up my street, and names like Jhumpa Lahiri, Susan Sontag, and Italo Calvino are on the covers of this book, defining it as something liked by people whose work I like and enjoy and trust, which gave me that extra bubble of excitement and made me want to get into it so much more. I'll read to you the synopsis so you can see why it is certainly one that's up my street. It says, It's the height of summer in 1930s Italy and 16-year-old Ginia is desperate for adventure. So begins a fateful friendship with Amelia, a stylish and sophisticated artist's model who envelops her in a dazzling new world of bohemian artists and intoxicating freedom. Under the spell of her new friends, Ginia soon falls in love with Guido, an enigmatic young painter. It's the start of a desperate love affair, charged with false hope and overwhelming passion, destined to last no longer than the course of a summer. The Beautiful Summer is a heart-wrenching tale of lost innocence and first love by one of Italy's greatest writers. So from this book, what I was expecting was a sense of that bohemian lifestyle, that artist on the fringe living, which would be contrasted with the very strong Italian culture behind it, showing people's lives burgeoning through an oppressive religiosity that defines them and yet doesn't at the same time. The structure of this book is extremely interesting. Pavisi has translated a lot of American literature into Italian, and so he has a sense of a different kind of writing, a new kind of writing, writing, that he, writing to him that inspired and excited him, that broke away from the traditional prose style. And you can see that being drawn here in this book. His sentences are fractured, his sense of time and place is also fractured, and yet it's captured so well because we're seeing the story through the eyes of a 16 year old girl. Her ideas are equally as fleeting as she goes from place to place to idea to new passion, new dream. She's constantly trying to define herself through the people that she's around and yet constantly contrasting herself to them at the same time. She's not quite sure of who she is. She's not quite sure of what she wants. So when the sentences are as fleeting as, her, as those thoughts in her head, you begin to feel that sense of helplessness and teenage loss and struggle, which I found absolutely riveting and absolutely fascinating. Though I must say at times, it was also quite confusing. And I don't know whether it's Pavisi's writing himself or whether it's the translation. There were times when the jumps between time and place and characters didn't make sense. And I don't know whether it's because in the English language, we've lost those gendered nouns, which helps define the context, especially in regards to Ginny's character, in that she has a wide group of friends and each one is so different yet at the same time so very much the same. So when you're lost trying to define who is who, 
because the author refuses to say their name. We don't have those other signifiers to represent these people. And while that could be a tactic on the author's behalf, I do actually think it could be something that has been lost in translation. And yet, as the, as the days, weeks, months pass of this summer in Italy, so does our understanding of the story and our main character. The first few chapters are a little bit rocky in that respect, but as it goes on and you get used to the writing style and you get used to the characters, and a lot of the characters do peter out quite quickly as Jania becomes obsessed with an artist, we also become more deeply rooted in the story itself and lose that sense of confusion, yet still keep that sense of disjointed thoughts and disjointed ideas as Jania explores herself and her own sexuality. The bohemian lifestyle of this book is captured beautifully. We are given the sense of luxury, of time and pleasure and hedonism. The characters who are living this lifestyle are very much embodied fully within it when descriptions of them doing things constantly depict the sense of freedom and pleasure and joy at just simply living and simply being. We learn what it means for these people to practice art and whilst we get a very narrow perspective of that, it still shows the way that artists within this movement were trying to break through new boundaries, new moulds that had been placed upon them not only by their society but their own group of friends. Whilst the story was said in Turin, it very much reminded me of Café de Floy in Paris as the existentialists and all the writers sat at one café to discuss philosophy and to discuss their work and to discuss art and life and being. Again, we have a similar café in this story where the characters come to meet each other to talk about art and to find new artists and to share their mind with other creatives who are also who are also living within this city. So having that familiar setting made it very easy for me to dip into this book and to stay within the world. And I very much enjoyed that, yet there was a dark side of this story, there was a dark side of the Bohemian lifestyle. And I have a quote here which encapsulates that from quite early on in the book. She could not convince herself that Barbetta, that plump, pompous old artist, had drawn, rubbed out, squared up Amelia's legs, back, belly and breasts, he didn't look her in the face. Those grey eyes and that lead pencil had fixed, measured and scrutinised her more shamelessly than a mirror and put an end to her gaiety and chatter. I love sentences that are structured like that in which they begin to say something and then you get the repetition of different adjectives to describe different kinds of meaning to what the characters are doing or what the characters are seeing. Within this context, the contrast between the man's grey eyes and the lead of the pencil really provides us with that look into the artist as an objective set of eyes, yet still putting subjective meaning onto woman's bodies as he draws them. Throughout the story, we get little snippets like that, in which the main character defines her own femininity and sexuality through the artists that she interacts with and the other women who she sees posing for them. There is definitely a strong binary between the man and the woman which is indicative of 1930s Italy, yet at the same time, hearing the story through a woman's perspective does give us the potential to see the damage that the male gaze can cause on particularly young and impressionable women. So while I very much enjoyed all these aspects, trying to contextualise this book within that Italian setting and within that mindset of misogyny did create a sort of uncomfortable awareness within this book. In many ways, this book did explore female sexuality in a way which is different to the common mindset of this particular time and era. And likewise, we also cannot escape the religious beliefs of the time that dictated the way people lived. So that is something you must always bear in mind when reading a book like this. A classic from a, from a particular era is not going to have the same mindsets and perspectives that we have today. And it is therefore unfair to project our own ideals onto books. Yet this is where I struggle in trying to define whether I want to give this book four stars or three stars. I very much enjoyed the writing and I can very much view this book as an object of its time and its place, yet there are some things which made me quite uncomfortable and didn't feel were wholly necessary. Considering we are exploring the Bohemian Circle of Turin, we should be getting a more freer, more lively perspective of these people's lives. We do have one character who is pro progressively portrayed as 
either bisexual or lesbian. It's hard to define, but her sexuality is quite free. And as the story progresses, perhaps she does become more aware of her lesbianism. That exploration of that woman's sexuality was very interesting throughout the book, and the plotting of her character arc was beautifully done. Yet at the end of the day, she caught syphilis from a woman and was damned by all those around her who didn't even want to touch her. For me, that was very uncomfortable. It was the very much typical, this character has to be punished for their queerness. This female character was punished by the author, and I don't think that was wholly fair. So you can see how the author was affected by his culture and his time, and I would be able to almost forgive that if he wasn't so dead set on portraying the bohemian lifestyle and a free lifestyle. The liberation that he rewarded his characters was very much for the men, and the women who were given the space to explore were punished every time they stepped out of line. And I feel that's an injustice given to the women within that particular bohemian circle. Throughout very similar artistic movements in European history, women were living within them. Women were creating incredible art, providing new voices to these things, yet still they were kept in the black rooms of history to be forgotten and to to not be aligned with these movements. So when you have men writing about these particular artistic groups, you do always lose those feminine voices, which I feel has happened with this book. And considering that the story is told from a female's perspective, you would have thought that the author would be a little bit more fair in his dealing with women's voices and women's experiences. So then that puts me in this conundrum of whether or not I should still see it as a text of its time, it's a text of its culture, or whether I should hold it to higher standards because it is trying to depict a female's experience in an artistic movement and fails in that respect. So were it not for that, this would definitely be a solid four-star read. The writing, the prose, the story is wonderful. And it's just that discomforting reality that I'm trying to navigate through as I begin to ask more for historic accounts of artistic movements like surrealism, like existentialism, and even like the artists between the wars in Italy that we should be seeing in this book and not quite receiving. So overall this book is a good read and I think you can't help but see it from a critical perspective because of the way it is portrayed and written. The author himself is obviously very critical of literature and what he defines as new and exciting prose to evolve literature into something else. He encaptures that very much in his text and it allows you to bear witness to his understanding of literature and then your further understanding of the growth of literature in the time that Pavisi was writing. And so in that respect, it does create a new and exciting read, just like Death in Spring did. The prose was different, it was intriguing, it kept you rooted into the story and wanting to know what was happening next. The same could be said for this book. There were just a few things that I felt were either lost in translation or lost in context. But overall, I do think this is a solid contender in the European Writers series, and I'm definitely intrigued as to the next one that's coming out in autumn. I think it's a great series and a great concept behind it, and whilst there were a few things with this book that didn't hold up to the way Death in Spring did, I still think in its own right it is a good, solid read, and one that definitely encaptured that teenage desire that seems so alien to you at the age of 16. So I would suggest people to read this, but I would suggest going into it with a critical perspective and have that make you question your own consumption of books and literature and place them within their context as cultural objects as opposed to being completely free of anything and policed by our current day perspectives. Life was a perpetual holiday in those days. We had only to leave the house and step across the street and we became quite mad. Everything was so wonderful especially at night when on our way back, dead tired, we still longed for something to happen, for a fire to break out, for a baby to be born in the house, or at least for a sudden coming of dawn that would bring all the people out into the streets. And we might walk on and on as far as the meadows and beyond the hills. You are young and healthy, they'd say, just girls without a care in the world. Going to sleep seemed silly and robbed you of time when you might be enjoying yourself. So thank you for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed this review. And I'll see you next time for another one. Bye bye.